So when you think of church, what do you think of? This is essentially what we are wanting to dig into in this teaching series. And we began it two weeks ago, and we're going to be tracking this idea right, right through this term. And to, to understand what church is, we're digging back into Jesus' own language for it. So in a sense, this is like a vision and values series for Anchor Church and, and like who we are, who we feel called to be. But we're also... We're really rooting that in what do we understand that Jesus imagined when he introduced this phrase church to his people? What did he have in mind? What was he dreaming of? What was he hoping for? What, what was in his imagination? Because it is his imagination that we seek to make manifest in our community today. Now, the word he used, as we've seen in the past couple of weeks, is the Greek word ekklesia. It means a community of people who are called out from a, from a nation, from a city, from a group of people, and given authority to direct the affairs of that city, that it may be blessed and it may thrive. And and as as we go through this term, we're going to be like, we're taking that basic premise that we are a group of people who have been called out by the living God with a view to stewarding the affairs of, of the city with his authority unto its blessing and well-being. And the first word we've been looking at in these first three weeks is the word apostle or apostolic. Um, and so a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the church being built on apostolic foundations. In other words, everything in what the church is and has been through history is meant to be built on this foundation of the apostles, as it says in Ephesians 2. And the ideas that we're building from there is that as the apostles were a group of people sent by Jesus, um, ap apostolos, the Greek word, was a, was a secular term as one who was sent by a king to enact their will and uh, to bring their culture in a different part of the world. As we are a people who are sent by our king into the city, that, that foundation that we build upon is meant to give us that direction of outwards. Therefore, what church is should not be towards like looking inwards as how does this benefit us, but rather is that which mobilizes us and galvanizes us and envisioned, envisions us to, to think how can we look outwards that the city may be blessed. Last week, we then looked at this whole idea of apostolic instinct. Um, articulating really that the apostolic instinct is the like created intuition in each one of us that somehow we were we were built for purpose we were we were designed and created to participate in the activity of God which is the recreation restoration healing and blessing of all things and that when we when we get down past all of our fears and insecurities and we dig down to like the roots of who we are there is this deep set like longing and desire to participate in building something beautiful, in seeing the, the, the dreams of God and that he inscribed into our hearts, like made manifest and real in the city. We're going to unpack that one later in the series when we get to the whole um, our core value of creativity. So we're going to go way further into that. But that's what we've come so far. Today, I want to look at creating an apostolic environment an apostolic environment. Because when we look at the early church and we look at the church of the scriptures, we see again and again that they, they formed a kind, of, a kind of culture, a kind of community, a kind of, um, a kind of like um, atmosphere of empowerment and belief and courage and creativity and wisdom and vision and love. And so today we're gonna to dig into that phrase, what does it look like to create an apostolic environment? But before we go there, I just want to like nail in on something which we see all over the New Testament, but we've not yet really named. So far, we've talked a lot about impact, that the apostolic church, the ecclesia of Jesus, is meant to be shaped towards impact. We are, we are meant to see business transformed. We are meant to see massive impact into situations of social injustice. We're meant to see our own families thrive and be beautified by God's presence and his will being enacted in and amongst us. But there's more than this as well, because the church of the New Testament also talks a lot about adding to their numbers. And I want to begin us here in this whole idea of numerical growth. Why? Because it's important and because it's biblical. Track with me. We're going to go into the book of Acts and I'm going to take us on a whistle stop tour of just how frequently this appears in the book of Acts. 
We start in Acts 2, verse 41. So those who received his word, Peter's word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Acts 2, 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 4, verse Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Acts 5.14, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Acts 6 verse 7, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Acts 9.31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Acts 9.42, it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Acts 14 verse 1, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Acts 16 verse 5, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. We can't go to the book of Acts without seeing that again and again. They want us to know that many, many people were coming to the Lord and that the numbers of the disciples was increasing exponentially and rapidly, not just in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, not just Judea, Samaria, but to the very ends of the earth. This is a vision for growth. And when we look at church history, we see this continue. We see that the church moving from that, that marginal group of, of disciples together in a room, 120 of them, the morning of Pentecost, 8.30 in the morning, just this little community of people, to 300 years later, the Christianization of the entirety of Europe. This, this movement from marginal to mainstream, where so rapidly thousands and thousands and thousands of people became inspired and mobilized by this incredible peasant preacher <laughs> who died the death of a criminal and was purported to have raised from the dead. This story, this reality, so captured the hearts of people that it, it, it rapidly went through the empire. And still today, millions of people follow him. Growth has always been present in the story of the church. But, but, we also have to balance this on the other side with recognizing that when we talk about numbers, it often makes people who've been in the church for a while just a little bit uncomfortable. Speaking at um, Gastry Church, um, our, our, our mother church in Birmingham, um, a couple of years ago, John Mark Comer came and did some work with worship leaders. And he said that often church, we, we, we assess our, our value and our success by four things. He said we assess it by butts budgets, buildings, and bars. How many butts are on the seats? How cool are our buildings? How big are our budgets? And how good is the, like, the feel of the bars and the environment when you come in? He said the problem with this is this is not the way Jesus talked. This is not the values by which he identified the health and the well-being of the church. Rather, when we look at the ministry of Jesus, he often seems to emphasize the small. He's the, he's the Jesus who says, leave the 99 sheep to go out after the one. He's the Jesus who says the kingdom is like a mustard seed. He's the Jesus who says where two or three are gathered, I am there with them. Jesus often seems to say, I want you to go radically focused and attentive upon the one person in front of you. So what I think we need to do is I think we need to somehow like pull together this like Acts style, style vision for growth in the church with this Jesus vision of intentional focus upon the one radically, passionately, lovingly, sacrificially, because within this, we're getting a little bit closer to the kingdom principle we need to get to. Open your Bibles with me. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4, because Jesus teaches right into how this works in this chapter. We're going to go to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 9. And essentially, this is a chapter where Jesus talks a lot about how growth happens in the kingdom. And it's really interesting, the language he uses. It goes like this. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat on uh, in it on the sea and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land and he was teaching them many things in parables and in his teaching he said to them listen behold a sower went out to sow and as he sowed some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil and when the sun rose it was scorched 
and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell amongst thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing in and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You'll notice that in this story, Jesus assumes that growth is the outcome. He wants fruitfulness. This, this is an agrarian society where they know that their crops need to multiply or they don't eat. But Jesus isn't actually giving a parable which is focused on that end. Rather, interestingly, this is a parable about the soil. What kind of soil are you trying to grow this stuff in? If the seed falls on the path, it's not there long enough. The birds eat it and it's gone. If it falls in the rocky ground, it can't go. It can't uh, grow roots and so nothing will grow. If it grow, falls amongst thorns, then it's strangled and throttled and nothing can grow. But if it falls in good soil, then fruitfulness happens. Jesus, I think, is pointing to a principle of the kingdom, a principle that we need to know, that, that when we think about multiplication in the kingdom, if we, if we focus on, on the numbers, very quickly we become, we become driven, stressed, striving and trying to create something in our, own, in our own strength. However, in the ways of the kingdom, if you focus on the soil, if you focus on the, the atmosphere and the environment within which growth can happen, growth will come. In other words, Jesus is introducing a paradigm to us where, where growth is the product of health. You, if you want to see something grow, rather than focus on the numbers or the impact, what you focus on instead is the health of what you are a part of. Growth for Jesus sits in this realm of health. Take this into the contemporary church, and we see exactly the same thing. Um, listening to an uh, interview in the summer by a pastor, um, a guy called uh, Ray Johnson, who um, is the pastor of a church in the States called Bayside Church. And in 2019, Bayside Church was identified as the fastest growing church in America. And he was interviewed about this, and, and people said to him, well, what's the secret? Why is it growing so fast? And what he said was really interesting. He said we have 15 core values, but this is our first one. Health is more important than growth. He said we don't have any growth goals. For us, it's all about, is this a community where people are thriving? Is there community? Is there belonging? Is there flourishing? Is there love? Is there empowerment? Is there creativity? If we have a healthy environment, then the growth will come. Gateway Church, another of the biggest churches in America, is led by a man called Robert Morris, and he writes this. Here's a deep cosmic truth for you. Healthy things grow. God has woven this principle into the very fabric of creation. The converse of this is true as well. When a living thing becomes unhealthy, growth stops and even reverses. This means that if your vision involves growth, your real objective should be health. Whether a church, ministry or organisation is involved, you can be confident that if you pursue health, growth will be a naturally occurring byproduct. Owen Raphael McManus, whose book, An Unstoppable Force, is one of my top five books of all time and is really foundational to a lot of the things that we speak about in, in Anchor. He writes this, The apostolic ethos not only empowers us to make manifest the imagination of God, it does, but it also creates an environment for spiritual health. And spiritual health is expressed substantially in and through emotional, relational, intellectual and physical well-being. Coming back this side of the Atlantic, Pete Hughes, leader of KXC Church in, in, in London, says this. As a church leader, I find the constant temptation is to emphasise programmes for church growth rather than emphasise becoming like Jesus. The temptation is to focus our energy on what is more measurable rather than embracing the costly work of loving people through ups and downs, mentoring people in the spiritual disciplines and training people to live out their faith. This doesn't mean I'm against church growth. I love it, pray for it and desperately want it. The end goal is never a larger church, but redeemed lives, renewed cities and a restored creation. 
There is nothing wrong with growing a church. Growth is good, it's beautiful, it's a kingdom principle and thank him that we are part of a church that is growing. But the vision and the emphasis in the healthy church, in the, in the apostolic church, is always on the health of the organisation. The, the apostolic environment, in other words, is, the, is that health context which nurtures a culture within our community that is loving, that is wise, that is encouraging, that sees each other as God sees us, that calls each other on to the things that God has called us to be, that shows up when it's tough. The apostolic environment enables the church to be sent because we are a people who steward health amongst us and our cities can thrive when we become a thriving community. That's the vision. The apostolic church therefore does not pursue numbers nor does it achieve impact through drivenness and stress. Rather, it grows in numbers and impact through the cultivation of a healthy culture. We call this atmosphere that enables growth the apostolic environment. It is the culture of the kingdom within which healthy growth inescapably happens and we all play a part in its generation. This is something that as leaders we hold and we are in part responsible for. But the reality is that an apostolic environment cannot simply be held by a small group of people. We can, we can name it, we can live it, we can, we can chase it, we will pray for it. But the reality is that to create this, all of us have a part to play. And so what I wanna do for the rest of our time together here is to nail in on what does this therefore look like for each one of us in the creation and building of this vision. If, if the multiplication of the church, if the impact on the church, if the growth of the kingdom is truly dependent on the, on the quality and the health of what we are together, then how do we make it healthy? How do we become really good soil? There's so many words that we could pull out in the New Testament around this. We could talk about being an honouring culture. We could talk about being an encouraging culture. We could talk about being an equipping culture or a, or, a, or a community with unity. All of these things would be true and right. But I think behind all of these different phrases is one word that the scriptures just put before us again and again and again and again. And it's the dead, simple, often misunderstood, often cheapened and diluted and sentimentalized words, love. Love in the scriptures is something so much more than the cliched cards or the, um, the, the way we've often cheapened it in, in the media or social media. It is something fiery and powerful and it is the formative value of the kind of culture Jesus dreamed of. This is why it appears all over the New Testament. And there's maybe one chapter where, where this is articulated maybe better and more clearly than anywhere else. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you've been to a wedding in church, you've probably heard it, but flick with me in your Bible. If you've got a Bible with you, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to just read us some verses from there. Reading from verse one, goes like this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, he's saying if I engage in the supernatural, if I speak the languages of angels, if I speak to mountains and tell them to move but have love, it doesn't count for anything. If I, if I give sacrificially all that I have, if I am martyred for what I believe but do it without love, it counts as nothing. If I have incredible wisdom, if I understand all mysteries of God, if I have incredible knowledge but do it without love, Love counts for nothing. Then he goes on. Love, he says, is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We're going to nail in on this last verse because these little four little phrases love 
bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. They give us these like four kind of interwoven ideas around how love works and just give us a little insight into the picture of what this apostolic environment, this community that is characterized and defined by love looks like. So let's begin with the first one. Love bears all things. Uh, the, the word here is like, is a word that sort of suggests holding something up, but also sheltering something. It's kind of like the word that you'd use for a roof. Like if you are building a building, you want it to have to be able to hold the roof up strongly, but also shelter you from the rain. The, the, the word used, Paul, who writes this, is trying to say to us, you need to be a people who hold each other up and create a shelter when it's raining. This is a word about being present in the pain. This is a word about about being being persistently walk uh, walking companions with each other when things are difficult. This is a word that says that if you are unable to hold yourself up, I'm going to join you. Galatians six verse two says this: Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfil the law of Christ. If you want to fill everything like that, Jesus talks about: bear one another's burdens. Like if you see someone in the community who is carrying something heavy, then our, our, our role isn't to say that's sad from a distance, but it's to say, how can I come alongside this person and build them up? If we see someone struggling with their mental health, it is, it is not to say that's, that's difficult and awkward and so I'm going to separate myself, but it's to say, how can I come alongside you? Help me to understand what you are processing. Help me to, um, to journey the pain and the difficulty of this with you. What can I do that is helpful? How can I serve you? How can I encourage you? How can I build you up? It is to say, I will be present with you even if I don't know how to fix this. I will walk with you. The in the in the in the ways of Jesus, there is there is no such thing as like hold it alone. But the vision is always that we come alongside each other and we say, okay, there's a pain here, let's hold it together. If there's a financial need in our community, it's not to say that sucks for them, but at least we're okay. It's to say, actually, this is a community held thing. So can we hold it together? Can we contribute into this need? Can we hold your need alongside our need so that we actually carry each other forward? If someone is sick in our community, rather than let it sit as a distance, say, how can we journey you through this pain? How can we weep with you in this and pray for your healing in this moment? How can we be present within this moment with you so you don't carry it alone? The vision, the, the, the hunger, the apostolic environment is a place where people say, there is no problem here that's held solo. We all gather around and lift this up. When me and um, Lydia, many of you know, we've got three kids. Um, but before Esty was born, um, me and Lydia lost our first um, baby, a beautiful little baby girl who we called Evie. And she, um, we've shared this story before, so I'm not going to tell it in, in long detail now. But you, yeah, I think you guys know it's, a, um, it sits close, very close to our hearts. But I, I just wanted to share briefly, um, when, when Evie died, in, she was still in the womb. And, um, and uh, Lydia needed to be induced um, and to, to give birth to her. And as you can imagine, that was pretty tough and um, yeah, just full of grief and, um, and God was hugely present and all of those things, but it was a difficult time. But, but while we were in hospital, we had some friends who had keys to our house. And we came back from hospital and we were exhausted and grieving and it was hard. But these friends had come into our house and they had put daffodils in every single room of our house. <laughs> um, they must have bought hundreds of daffodils. And it was just this, just such a beautiful encouragement. And just, it was like a little emblem of how can we come alongside you and bear something with you here? How can we bring beauty and hope and life into this moment for you? Community does that. The apostolic environment does that. It carries each other's burdens because this fulfills the law of Jesus. Second thing, love believes all things. Alan Hirsch and Tim Catchin write this, apostolic movements thrive in the atmosphere of belief. All movements breathe an atmosphere of can do, or perhaps even better, will do. This is not just like an organizational principle though. This is a deeply 
personal relational community one this is a this is a uh, the, the word belief is um, is not just like uh, which we sometimes make it like I know you exist but this actually more goes into like the, the that kind of deeply powerful words of I I have expectation for you I believe that you are able I know that you are becoming more than you currently feel like you are I see who you could be I see you as God sees you I have trust in you I have loyalty to you I will journey my life alongside you like longing for and working for and calling out who I know you really to be. This is so powerful and so important, and particularly in the moments where we feel discouraged, where we're actually, where we're struggling with, with shame, we need someone to come alongside us and to speak honor into us, where we're struggling with feeling incapable, to have people who come alongside us and say, okay, I know who you are, come on, I know what you are capable of, do you know who walks with you? To be, to be a people who, who to contend for one another in great and fervent confidence of who we sh- we can be, who we really are. In essence, it is to be a people who see one another as God sees us. Because often I find that in my deepest, darkest moments of despair and discouragement and thinking, what am I doing with my life? How I can't do this. I don't know what I'm doing. What comes back to me is the affirmation that, you know what, but the Father believes in me. He believes in me. And if he believes in us and Jesus believes in us, we need to be that for each other. Abraham Lincoln said, I am a success today because I had a friend who believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. Who will be a success tomorrow because you believed in them today? When you look around your community, who are you Who are you dreaming for? Who do you see who actually just needs lifted up again? Who do you know just needs you as a friend to come alongside them and say, let me remind you who you are. I want to tell you who you are. This is then unpacked in the very next phrase. Love hopes all things. Hope is to see like... It's to see what could be and to and to let your present moment be transformed because you're so confident it's gonna happen. It's it's to sit with someone who is in the most dark and depressing and broken place and to say, yeah, I, I, I get that, but I see beyond it. When, when you're really suffering, when things are really tough, in that moment, often you are the person who can't see that, but love, the loving community, the apostolic environment comes alongside that person and says, let me tell you what I can see. Let me tell you what, what I believe for you. Let me tell you what I'm praying for for you. Let me tell you what I'm hoping for for you. There's a great um, movie from the 90s. I know some of you guys would have seen, um, Cool Runnings. Um, which is just um, just a legendary movie, and there's an amazing scene in it where uh, two of the Jamaican bobsleigh team, who the um, um, film centres around, they're in a bar, and um, after like a, a confrontation in the bar, two of the bobsleigh team go out into the toilets and have a conversation, and the smaller of the two, a guy called Junior, low self confidence, doesn't believe in himself, um, is taken in there by the other guy, Yule Brenner. And your brother says, okay, Junior, look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Junior says, I see Junior. He something, sees something small and ordinary and incapable and weak. Your brother says, let me tell you what I see. I see pride. I see power. Um, if we were in person, I'd say, speak along with me, because I know you know it. I see a badass mother who won't take no crap of no one. There's something in your brainer in that moment which just espouses this idea. And as he speaks these words to Junior, Junior's like whole life raises and his outlook on who he is changes and his way of living and interacting with people changes because someone came alongside him with a vision of hope who said, I tell you what I see for you. I tell you who I see you can be. The voice of hope empowers, it equips, it encourages, it puts courage into one another. Hope is so powerful. Owen McManus, to quote him again, said this, We are God's voice of hope. Those who have known nothing but condemnation and shame will find a new beginning in Jesus Christ. This should be one of the markers of a New Testament community. Yet even beyond being a voice of hope for the individual, the church should be a place of inspiration about the future. We are to be a voice of hope because we are a people of hope. A follower of Jesus has no excuse for pessimism. The voice of hope enables and it mobilizes. It it speaks truth upon each other about what God is creating and building in us. It is prophetic and transformative and powerful. It joins somebody in the moment. 
and says, even if you feel like you are stumbling in this moment, let me tell you what I see. The apostolic environment mobilizes people because in that place of health and encouragement, creativity is reborn, boldness is reborn. The people of God are galvanized afresh to partake in his mission. The fourth thing, love endures all things. Love doesn't walk away. I have a friend who um, was having a difficult time in his faith a number of years ago. And he, um, and he shared this with some friends and he shared it with some friends who were Christians and some friends who weren't Christians. And tragically, the friends who weren't Christians, they kind of walked away in that moment. Whereas his friends who were Christians, they were the ones who showed up. This is just a tragedy. It's an inversion of the vision of Jesus and the way things should be. The Christian friends maybe felt that because he wasn't kind of one of them anymore, that was their moment to withdraw. And it was brutally wounding on on the faith that he had. And yet the, the, the longing of Jesus, the vision of love, the endures all things vision of what love can be and the apostolic environment can be, is the picture of the person who is actually there no matter what. Who no matter what you're going through, who no matter what's happening, you resolutely will be there championing, encouraging, persisting, believing, faith, hope, empowerment, lifting up, constantly, constantly there. Scholar, uh, New Testament scholar, Leon Morris, and forgive the dated and slightly misogynistic language to this, uh, wrote this, the verb um, hypomeno, which is the word used for endure here, denotes not a patient, resigned acquiescence, but rather an active, positive fortitude. It is the endurance of the soldier who in the thick of battle is undismayed, but continues to lay about him lustily. Love is not overwhelmed, but manfully plays its part, whatever the difficulties. Love is like that. It is gritty and passionate and ongoing and says, I will be there for you. The apostolic environment is this place. It's this place where we champion each other, where we see who each other could be, where we, where we do it together, where we see giftings and potential and dreams and, and goodness in, we, in, in each other. And we name it and we call it out. We empower and we mobilize one another because we see each other as God sees us. We carry the imagination of God himself for each other, seeing not who we are and marred by our own wounds and brokenness, but who God created us to be because that's how he calls us to see each other. The Passion Translation of this verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 7 goes like this. Love is, a sa- love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love, love never takes failure as defeat and it never gives up. This is our mandate. This is our vision is to say like Jesus is so passionate about the healing and blessing and transformation of the city. He longs to send us out. But the reality is that if we want to steward this kind of atmosphere this this kind of this kind of work in the city it begins by saying how do we build a culture among us that empowers equips blesses raises up bears each other's burdens loves each other as he loved us because that love is always a springboard for activity it's always the inspiration it's always the mobilization it's always the 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 context within which all ministry and mission and purpose can happen because we are loved because we're loved by the father and because we love each other just like jesus loved us when Jesus speaks to his disciples on the night before he died, he, he says to them that um, the world watching is going to know who you are by one thing, that you love one another. John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The apostolic environment is the community of love that acts as a springboard into activity for each one of us, that encourages, blesses, loves and journeys with each other. Because in this environment, the, the, the dreams and the longings and the, and the activity of God can burst into being and the growth can come from the place of health. Let's pray. Yeah, Heavenly Father, I think we, 
I think we are longing today to be a people who can steward uh, that that kind of community, that kind of vision for each other that mobilizes and blesses and empowers all that you long us to be in a community. Jesus, our anchor is in you and we want to learn to love each other and to see each other and to call each other on just like you did for us. We want to be washers of each other's feet. We want to see through the brokenness of our past into the potential of our future. We want to be those who speak courage to each other when we are discouraged, who speak identity to each other when we have forgotten who we are in you, who speak compassion to each other when we have forgotten to be self-compassionate. Holy Spirit, in this moment now, I want to pray that you would fall on me and you would fall on each one of us to give us a greater measure of loving compassion for one another, to see each other as you see us. And Lord, as the city looks on, may all people know that, that your church in the city are the disciples of Jesus because they are blown away by the quality of love that is shared here for one another. Holy Spirit, come near, move in us right now, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.